Good afternoon. My name is Melissa Tucky, and I'm here with Makoma Wagugi, and we are here to talk about his new novel, Unbury Our Dead with Song. Makoma Wagugi is a novelist, poet, and a literary scholar. He's associate professor at Cornell University and author of, and maybe we can show some covers, author of The Rise Up of the African Novel, Politics of Language, Identity, and Ownership, and the novels Mrs. Shaw, Black Star Nairobi, Nairobi Heat, and also two books of poetry, Logotherapy and Hurling Words uh, at, at Consciousness. His most recent work and the work he'll be reading from today is Unbury Our Dead with Song. And his recently released novel uh, looks at a competing Tzitzita Zita, mm -hmm. Te Zita musicians. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm pleased and honored to introduce Makoma. Yeah, thank you, Melissa, for the introduction. Um, then I would also like to introduce you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I thought I would introduce you by reading one of your poems. Uh, but Melissa Taki, first we have been friends for a very long time now, uh, but she's a poet. She's actually the Poet Laureate uh, of Ithaca, where we are. Formerly. Oh, formerly, yeah, the former uh, Poet Laureate. Uh, she's a poet, writer, literary activist. Uh, she's the author of Tenuous Chapel and co-founder of Split the Rock, a national literary organization dedicated to supporting socially engaged poetry. Yeah, so and this is a, uh, it's called, the, the antho this anthology is called Ghost Fishing. An Echo Justice Poetry Anthology. And I think it's the first one, right, of its kind? Yes. Uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so it's a compilation from other poets as well, my, my, myself included, I should say. Yes. Uh, so, and the poem I'm going to read, for, for, written by Melissa, is called Ghost Fishing, Louisiana. And there is uh, an epigram or quote at the beginning uh, from Rebland Willie T. Sneed that reads These people are in prison and there's poison loose. That's not an ambulance, that's the sun going down in your rearview mirror. It gets in your clothes, it gets in the way you talk, and it thunder late at night, railroad cars full of poison bumping into one another. Gambling boats ghost fishing on Lake Charles. Sugar is refined here for sweet tea, flour bleached white, men selling melons the size of heads. Her house held the cancer like fish in a locked box. Thank you. No, thank you. That poem haunted mm. me for mm. many years, and mm. I think uh, as a segue, mm. I, I feel a lot of that haunting inside of this book mm. um, as we look at this music. And I wonder if we could go ahead and hear mm. Uh, mm -hmm. a passage from your book to start us out. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, Well, and can you tell us um, a little bit mm -hmm. about how you became drawn to the mm -hmm. subject of Tazita music? Mm. Yeah, so what happened was, and uh, maybe I'll talk about that and then read the passage. Yeah. Uh, what happened was, uh, in the early 2000s, I was living in Boston, and I went to, and I had Ethiopian friends, you know, and uh, they were having a party, right? We have a bunch of Pan-African people. Uh, so anyway, they were, we were having a party, and somebody played a Tazita, right? You know, and I listened to this song, and it just, I just got drawn in into it. I just got drawn into it. Um, but those were the days of cassettes and CDs. So after, after the party, I kept looking for the song and couldn't find it. And I kept asking people, you know, and anybody I would meet who was at the party, and including my Ethiopian friends, what was that song, what was that song? Uh, but, but I just couldn't find it. Uh, then when I was applying for a job here at Cornell, um, I read an essay by, by Doug Mai Woboshed, who then would become my colleague, uh, called, I think, The New World and Tizita, where he compares the music to, uh, to James Baldwin. You know, and then I realized that was a song, right? You know, so then I, I, I Googled it. You know, at that point, we had Google. <laughs> so I Googled it and found it. Uh, but funnily enough, I was listening to This Is America yesterday. Uh, or, or this is, what's the show called? Anyway, I was listening to a show yesterday. And they were talking about, um, oh, it's called This American Life, yep. Yeah, and they were talking about this old guy in his 80s who listened to, he would call his doctor, right? And the doctor would, you know, the, the, the wait song, what is it called? When, when you're put on hold. 
Oh. Yeah, so and he fell in love with that song and he couldn't find it. And he kept asking people, <laughs> you know, and then he said, he was saying people started thinking he's losing his mind. So I could really, I could relate to him because that's how it was for me. It just became this obsession. Huh. Uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, so you set out uh, to find the song, to find the music? Yes, yeah, so, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so once I found this song, uh, then I discovered that it, 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 it's, um, then I spent more time, you know, listening to it. Uh, and then I discovered that you have all these musicians, different musicians, you know, who, who have played this song right, with their own interpretations. So you can think of it like a sonnet, right? You know, it has a form mm -hmm. and rules, you know, that everybody follows, but they, ca they can have their own interpretations. So you can have somebody doing a tisita that is, um, you know, that, that's, that's, you know, like urban, if you will, like rock and rollish. Mm -hmm. Then you can have somebody just playing the tisita with the kra, which is a four string uh, Ethiopian instrument, or just with a masenko, right? Or jazz tisita, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, but the, the, the song itself is taken very seriously by Ethiopians from what, I, from what I came to understand, to such an extent that when a musician can be very, very popular, right? Mm -hmm. you know, it could be like a pop musician who's very, very popular. But if they sing the Tizita and mess up, <laughs> you know, their reputation is done, right? Mm -hmm. so, so it's taken very seriously, or people will argue about Dina, who is the best Tizita musician, and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, but let me read a passage here. Oh, yeah, so yeah, so just to set this up. Um, so you have, um, you have four, four, four Tizita musicians who come to Nairobi in a CD boxing club turned into a, into a bar um, to see who can sing the best Tizita, right? You know, so they're actually they're, they're competing on a boxing stage. Um, yeah, so and the, and the four characters are the diva or Kidane, you know, who is... Um, who has almost like a duality to her, right? Um, so all the characters have dualities to them. Uh, then you have the corporal, who is a former, who is a former soldier. Uh, you have um, uh, you have Miriam, uh, who is an, 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 a bartender from Ethiopia, but working in this in this city club. Uh, and then you have the Taliban man, who is, uh, as you can tell from the name, is a young hip hop kind of guy, right? <laughs> uh, so. Yeah, so now they're on stage, uh, all of them. This is the first scene. They're all, all, all on stage. And you have your narrator, too. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the story, yeah, the, 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 the narrator is Victor, Man, uh, sorry, no, his name is uh, Manfredi. Uh, and his story is that he comes from, um, from a family that gained a lot from the dictatorship and supported the, 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 the Moi dictatorship or the Kenya dictatorship. So very much unlike me, I should say. <laughs> Um, yeah, so but he, he hears this song, right, and then he falls in love with it. So, in a way, I give him my journey, right, you know, so he's taking the journey for me, right. Um, on stage, the musicians were enjoying themselves too much, and they left us behind. And by the time we caught up, it was to find Miriam playing the accordion, looking so slight and bent forward that I worried about her. But she was at it, pulling, ebbing, and letting out a gentle church organ sound in song. The accordion lungs expanding and contracting gently, breathing in and out layered prayers. She was swaying side to side, dipping in and out, lifting one foot in and out, wading out of the river of this tisita that as yet had no words. She stomped her feet, ran her right hand against her left on the accordion to create a confused upside down rainbows of sound and then a scissora. The silence transfixed, transfixed the drunkards, gamblers, slammers and the believers in place. The silence moved from being expectant to bordering on being painful. At the end of that silence, where the pain was turning into relief, the corporal with the Masenko came in and bored a long, devilish, trembling bass, low and threatening. But the Taliban man was not going to have us threatened, and his guitar with its clean, thin sound, note for note, came in. Miriam stopped her feet again, and silence reigned once again, and from that silence, she started singing low, Long moans gliding above and, un and, and underneath the lazy accordion. The Taliban man's guitar was getting more urgent, while the diva on the, on the piano was furious, and the corporal on his devilish masenko held everything together. Then the corporal left his post and came in with a low, buzzing sound of the masenko, mourning that was amplified by the slow wail of the, of the accordion as Miriam pulled it apart. Her voice, with a constrained rasp, came in once again. The Taliban man did a, a violent lead solo. The diva's piano jumped into the fray, playing peaceful but sharp, short, determined notes that threatened to undermine 
the Taliban man's work. They both went on for a while as we clapped and cheered and clapped the beat. They played on helping each other up when one of them faltered with a beaten timing. A few minutes into the jam, Miriam looked at the Taliban man and he slowed down his syncopated guitar playing and others followed suit. Silence, save for the low hum buzz of the Masenko and the sound of the accordion slowly running out of air. She winked at me. This once she said in English and she bent her voice low and joined the Masenko. When I dream of happy days, O oh, Tizita, wake me so I can find you once again. I fear so much that you, you too will leave me, and I'll forget this pain that carries my love. And Tizita, if I forget those I loved, how can I remember who I am? One day I'll be dead and gone, my grave untended, there of birth and death on my gravestone from centuries past. And only my Tizita will remain, only you will remain. Tizita, what I fear the most, is that I'll forget this pain that carries my love. You know, and then they go on, you know, uh, you know, playing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is that where the novel begins for you as a writer, um, with that uh, scene, or does it begin mm -hmm. with a character, or? Uh, well, yeah, I, for, for me, it, it, it does begin with them playing, right? Um, you know, but yeah, so, and what happened was, um, you know, I, I don't speak uh, Amharic or any Ethiopian language, you know, but I spend a lot of time listening to the Tizita, you know, I, I, I listen to it religiously, right? I still listen to it religiously. And eventually what happened was that um, I started hearing the human voice as an instrument, right? That, that's when I think the story broke for me, you know. Uh, and once I understood the human voice as an instrument, then I could listen and interpret the song. Uh, in the same way you can listen to jazz and think about the saxophone and the other instruments. Yeah, but suddenly it begins with them playing, uh, you know, and trying to imagine them, right, and trying to give each, um, each instrument its own voice and, you know, and also the characters their own voice. So, yes, yeah, so, so then you end up with, their, with four, maybe four, maybe five, if you, can, if you count Manfredi, uh, five looks, right, or five, five attempts to understand, it, yeah, five, five attempts to understand the same song. Mm -hmm. yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. I have a basic question about Tazita. Mm -hmm. um, is it, are the musicians lyricists? Mm -hmm. Are there different lyrics? Um, or yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah you, I mean, you have, so the, the, way, the way our scholars have described it and people have described it is that uh, Tazita means memory, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or longing, or melancholy, right? Mm -hmm. um, but by the way, for myself, I understand it. Is, it is, yeah, all those things are there. Uh, but as one of the characters said, I'll read that passage later, uh, it's almost like a 200,000 year archive of human emotion, right? Mm -hmm. You know, because it's a song that's been passed from generation to generation to generation. Uh, so in a way, when you're hearing the Tizita, you're also hearing, you know, this archive, right? Right. Uh, so in the same way, you know, like blues, you know, blues, it, it, many people can make fun of blues and say it's, it's uh, love, you know, but yeah, but but if you think about blues as an indictment of, of 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 slavery and oppression here in the U.S., if you think of the blues, if you think of the act of singing of love as, as a as an act of rebellion, then then you can begin to understand the blues better, right? Um, and so on and so forth. But I don't think I answered. Did I answer your question? <laughs> yeah. So there are there are different lyrics. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. So yes. Yeah. But 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 within a very. Uh, to my mind, within a, a very strict um, form, yeah, a strict form, right? You know, so yeah, so, and I, I think most of them, at least, uh, play instruments as well. Um, yeah, so, but yeah, so I don't, I don't know if you say they are lyri ly lyricists in the, in, 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 in the sense that they make up their words, right? Mm -hmm. um, but they are as well, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, within the form, yeah. yeah. And as an archive, are they drawing on, mm -hmm. on refrains and, mm -hmm. and tunes from the past? Uh, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. So, it, yeah, it, it's too bad we couldn't play any of the, um, yeah. for, for copyright issues. But for, 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 for anybody listening and is interested, um, I do have a playlist. I made a playlist of the songs I listened to when I was... Uh, when I was um, when I was writing the novel, so if you go to YouTube and just put in my name Mukoma playlist Tizita, uh, it's gonna come up, you know, and, and then and then you can see the different uh, the different variations 
or interpretations uh, of the Tizita. Mm -hmm. But, but, it's, it, but it's, it's, it's within this strict form, right? Uh, I think of it as containment, you know. So, with, because the Tizita is about humbling yourself uh, to this, beautifully humbling yourself to this 200,000 year archive of emotions, Right, you can't. Uh, I, I, I joke and I say you can't go like Whitney Houston on it and hit all these notes, right? So it's it's about being contained, your voice as well, and your instruments being contained with this form. Um, yes, and and and, and once, once you start listening to the musicians and the other songs, then you realize, oh, they can hit any note they want, right? <laughs> you know, they have a, they have a very wide range, but the tizita itself is not about showing off, right? It's it's about being contained within this um, within the form. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of that comes across in your novel too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and a little bit of hubris because I was like, well, can I can I carry music? <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, can I carry music in uh, <laughs> with words? Yeah, yeah. Right, and um, I think you do a good job in the opening mm -hmm. passage. I'm reminded of uh, mm -hmm. Sunny's Blues mm -hmm. by James Baldwin. Oh yeah, oh yeah, no, definitely. Yes. I mean, so yeah, Sunny's Blues. Um, you know, I mean, it's 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 a, it's a marvelous. I don't know even. It, 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 yeah, it's a sublime piece of writing, right? In capturing, right. Uh, in in terms of the giving of one's imagination, right, to capture sound, right? Yeah. So definitely, James Baldwin. Uh, I'm trying to think of other people I've I've read who you know who, have, who might have influenced how how I approach it. Yeah, but suddenly, yes, suddenly James Baldwin is up there, right? Yeah, and, right. And just, you know, so when I'm teaching, I use this essay by Susan Sonta called The Truth of Fiction, where she says love sentences, right? Love sentences agonize over words, right? You know, so and with James Baldwin and with good writers, you have that, you know, that sort of, yeah, I mean, you love, you know, you love the sentences and you love the, the words and so on and so forth. But you also agonize, you know, about the words themselves. Right. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. So, um, how long did it take you to write this book, and mm -hmm. um, what's your process? You mm -hmm. have written quite a few books mm -hmm. um, so far, and and how do you mm -hmm. balance your time? How do mm -hmm. you? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not I'm not a very disciplined writer, you know. So that's why I write when I have something to write. I know there are some writers who, excuse me, there are some writers who like to like wake up at five and work for two hours every day or have some sort of rhythm. Uh, for me, I write when I feel I have something to write. Um, this book took about four years, I would say, four to five years, right? Um, because and part of it was because I didn't want to write a bad book about the Tizita, you know, <laughs> in the same way you, know, you sing a bad Tizita, right? <laughs> you, you can ruin your reputation. I didn't want. I didn't want to write a bad book uh, or a book where I haven't given. Uh, where I haven't. I, I didn't want to write a book where I haven't given it all my imagination, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, but a lot of it was also spent, you know, listening to songs uh, and just and and trying to be in them. I don't know how to describe it, right? And try to be in in this song with my imagination, right? And and then you know and then come back and uh, you know and then come back and write. Uh, but um, just to show how seriously the Tizita is taken, I have two friends. I mentioned Doug Mari Wabosheth, my colleague here, and another friend of his from Ethiopia. At, at that point, I was, I, was, I was working on the book, and I asked them uh, if, they can, uh, if they can help me understand you know, the words right, uh, from this song by Bezawak, this Tizita by Bezawak. So we're in London, you know, we went to a pub, you know, <laughs> you know, already I had my pen and paper ready to, you know, to transcribe. Uh, but they couldn't agree on the first two sentences. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, yeah, so we spend I don't know like one hour or two hours, you know, with them agonizing over the you know, talking about organizing over agonizing over words, with them just trying to get through the first two the first two sentences. Right. It's uh, like yeah. poetry. Yeah, it's like po yeah, it's, yeah, it's like yeah, trying to sit down and uh, you know, and, and get the, the meaning, right? So I would say that is it I think something you feel, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think you feel more than you hear, right? Uh, and hopefully I was able to convey that, right? Mm -hmm. to, to convey that sort of, um, you know, and, and, that, and that's why you couldn't just have one character. I just couldn't have one character talking about the Tizita. Mm -hmm. you, it's almost like having Point. different frames, you know, looking at the same or mm -hmm. listening to the same song. Uh, in terms of process, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't have a process per se, but I do have different writing spaces, right? You know, so 
for example, I work in my office, you know, for maybe two or three months, and then I'll get out of that space, you know, then I'll start writing from bed, you know, and then eventually <laughs> move to the sitting room, you know, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Eventually a, ca a, a, a cafe or something, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, did you also travel um, to mm -hmm. Ethiopia while yeah, you I did. Yeah, I did. On yeah, this? I did, but when I, I think I, I went there when I was almost done with the book, actually, which I liked, I, you know, I liked doing that, right, because well, first, you know, it turned out my imagination, and this is the hubris again, mm -hmm. it turned out my imagination, you know, wasn't far off in terms of, um, in terms of it, my understanding, or my imagination's understanding of Ethiopia. Um, but at the same time, there, there are some things I was able then to come back and, and think about in, in the book that I wouldn't have otherwise, right? Right. Um, but when I was in Ethiopia, again with Doug Maui, uh, we went to, we went to this club, right? Uh, it was maybe like two or three o'clock in the morning, and it turned out the Mandingo, uh, who is one of the uh, one of the best known uh, Tizita musicians, happened to be in the crowd, wow. right? Yeah, so he was invited to get on stage. Um, he was invited to get on stage uh, by the musicians, and and he sang his Tizita. And, and I had never seen anything like this before, right? You know, people are around were around him before. They're on the dance floor, you know, dancing and so on and so forth. But everybody just sat down, right, and just listened, you know. So, mm -hmm. it, so about two or three o'clock in this club, just silence people listening to uh, to Mandingo. So, it, that sort of experience, I, I wouldn't have imagined it, right? And, right. and my imagination couldn't have thought that. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. So, so, so there were these little gifts as well right. uh, that come from that, that came from uh, visiting Ethiopia. The um. We have a question from an audience mm -hmm. member. Maybe we can take sure. it. Did mm -hmm. Tizita originate in a particular Ethiopian mm -hmm. ethnic group? No, I'm not sure. Okay, so that, that's the thing, right? Um, what I do know is that it, that the Tizita is associated with Asmaris, you know. Uh, so I don't know. You could, you could think of them like um, like griots, you know. So people who move from place to place singing. Um, but at the same time, I do have a friend, you know, who was, you know, who pulled out some Tizita, Christian Tizita songs, right? So, so I don't know. I, you know, I, I can't say it's from one ethnic group. Mm -hmm. um, myself, I would say it's, to my mind, it's almost like the total history uh, captured in song mm -hmm. uh, of Ethiopia, right? Uh, also, I'll say that um, one of the questions I think I, I wanted to ask and hopefully answered was, if if Africa, if Africa could sing, right? It, it, imagining all the things that we have seen from slavery, the colonialism, neo-colonialism, you know, and now you know, COVID apartheid, what is vaccine apartheid, and so and, and with like with all the things we have seen, mm -hmm. and at the same time with all the beauty that we have seen as well, right? If 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 that could be a song, what would it sound like, mm -hmm. right? And my answer for that was it, it was it would come out like a tizita. Yeah, yeah, so, but there are scholars who, uh, who, unfortunately, I can't remember their names now, but there are scholars um, who have written about the Tizita. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, one, at one point in the book that really struck me, mm -hmm. uh, the diva, I mm -hmm. think it is, yeah, yep, insists yeah. that the, the narrator mm -hmm. visit mm -hmm. her home uh, mm -hmm. and visit Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. And there's a real sense in, as I'm reading it, mm -hmm. of the connection between the land mm -hmm. and the music, mm -hmm. um, as well as the history and the culture and, and mm -hmm. all of that. Um, can you say, mm -hmm. did you, is there something to mm -hmm. the land itself and the relationship? Yeah, so, yeah, so I mean, it, uh, or the people? Yeah, the but, yeah so yeah, because they end up in, in, in the diva at this point, because when she's out performing her pop songs, she's the diva, right? But when she's singing the Tizita, she, she's herself, Kidane, right? You know, so they go to this rural area where she lives with her family. Um, but uh, so I, I definitely think about landscape a lot, right? But, but that particular relationship to me would come from the sort of relationship I had uh, growing up in Kenya with our landscape. Uh, well, yes, yeah, so when I was growing up, we'd go visit my grandmother. It was maybe like two or three miles, you know, and we'd be going up and down valleys, right? It, it was very, very beautiful. It's only later that I realized that the reason why those valleys existed, uh, it was because uh, during, during, uh, during um, colonialism, uh, the British essentially had concentration camps, right, you know, mm -hmm. for, 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 for Kenyans. 
and so they will be concentrated in a, in a in a makeshift village if you want to call it that and then around that they will be they will dig these big trenches right and then there will be spikes in there uh and then there will be only one gate uh going into the village and the reason for that was because they didn't want uh at that point there was the kenya land and freedom army the mau mau uh an armed you know revolutionary movement right that was trying to oust the, the british they didn't want them to get any help right from the people yeah, so, so that's sort of a relationship where, on the, on the one hand, here I am now, it's post-independence, right? And I'm going through this, um, yeah, I'm going to visit my grandmother and working through history as well. So, it's, yeah, so I definitely had that. And, and of course, Ethiopia has its own, uh, you know, its own tragedies. Uh, I mean, right now, you know, and there is the, what's happening in the Tigray region, right? But then before that, you had war between Eritrea and Ethiopia. At the same time, you have this beautiful history where, uh, Ethiopia was never colonized, right, and defeated the the Italians when they attempted to, you know, to colonize them. So, yeah, and, and all those things are contained in the soil, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And in the music, as you describe. Yeah, and, yeah, and, and, and in the music, and, and in the music, right? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, it, yeah, so all these beauties and tragedies eventually become this, um, you know, sublime, uh, sublime song called the Tizita. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. So, uh, say something. Was there a moment in your process of writing that surprised you? Uh, you have these four characters mm -hmm. um, in a contest and mm -hmm. this journey. Um, yeah. So yeah. So when when I was when I started writing it, I thought there would actually be a winner, right? You know, because you know they're out there performing, right? And they have, they have come to compete to see who can sing the the best music, which of course you wouldn't do in real life, right? I don't. They, 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 it's it, yeah, you just can't do it, right? You you can't just compete to see it. It, it defeats the purpose of the tizita. Right. Yeah, but in the fictionalized form, I actually thought there there would be a winner. So when they are performing uh, in this in front of this crowd at the ABC Club, the City Boxing Club. You know, the idea the idea I had was, you know, they would sing, you know, then the drunkards would be like, yeah, we're going to pick one winner. And then, um, you know, and then that person is crowned the best visitor, you know, musician. Um, but um, but the musicians resisted it uh, when I started writing it, right? They just they just couldn't compete. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, they do take turns singing, right, and, and, and right. playing the tizita. But but at some point, you know, in the opening and in, in, in the first time they're competing, they all get on stage, right? That's that's a scene I read, right? You right. Know, they all get on stage, uh, and then of course, you know, then I thought, okay, okay, fine, they don't want to compete, mm -hmm. but surely the crowd, <laughs> you know, can at least still decide who won. But the, but but then the crowd listening also understands what's happening, right? Even right. though they may be disappointed, so so that that sort of resistance was surprising to me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, what about the characters? Mm. Do, did you find yourself, do you ever, mm. do you live with these characters in mm. your head as you walk around? Do you, mm. do you um, ever find yourself getting annoyed with a character mm. or <laughs> do um, you struggle with the characters or um, uh -huh. yeah, no, I'm, dance I'm with them? Or? Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, so, okay, so, um, when I, 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 I just gave a, a presentation uh, of the book, at, um, Revolution Books in New York, and uh, one person there asked me, she's a writer, you know, so she asked me, um, how do I deal uh, with the post-trauma of writing a book? Oh, right? yes. And it's something I've been thinking about as well in terms of, you know, because the stuff sometimes you write about, it, it involves trauma, right? Whether you can get PTSD, right? <laughs> Whether you can get PTSD from writing. and. Huh. And I believe, uh, for example, my first novel, Mrs. Shaw, you know, I have this terrible character, you know, who's a torturer, you know, who, you know, who's a, who likes to torture his prisoners, then get them better, right? And, uh, and then the threat, of, of course, of, of torturing them again breaks them, right? Mm -hmm. So they endure the first torture with, you know, with, the, uh, with dignity, and then the second time they can't. They can't. Uh, and it's set in a dictatorship, right? Um, yeah, so, so I, I, and I, it could be that I grew up in a dictatorship myself, so it could be that, uh, you know, that trauma is relieved. Right. Uh, or it could be that indeed you can, because you're, you're spending so much time with these characters and thinking about, you know, in this case, a torturer kind of character. Um, 
you know, so, but I think with the Tizita novel, it was different. Um, so I would say if Mrs. Shaw gave me PTSD, yeah. <laughs> you know, then the, the Tizita novel healed me, right? You know, because these are characters who have seen so much, uh, mm -hmm. but they have found a way of, of not necessarily healing, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but a way of understanding that, that, they are, that maybe their pain is historical, right? And then they sing, you know, to connect people to, to that history, um, yeah. So, but I, I, I found it. To, I, I found writing this novel to be very healing in in, in that regard. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, so the, the characters don't come up with any. They're not easy answers for the characters, right? You know. Um, but they, but for them, singing the Tizita is a way of, 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 of just saying it's okay, or just saying if you're here, you're doing well, right? If you're here, mm -hmm. you're still doing okay. Uh, but then, of course, you're also part of this long archive. When I was. Um, when I was writing the novel, uh, at that point I was commuting between um, Ithaca and Connecticut. So I, rent, I, had, I had to rent a place here, and the place I rented, at the back of it, was a, there was a cemetery, right? It was a, an abandoned cemetery, mm. you know, and so, mm. so sometimes I would go and walk around there. And that's, that's when I started thinking of, okay, so, I mean, eventually this is where we'll all end up. You know, it's inevitable that at some point, uh, these graves, you know, that we mm -hmm. put so much work into and, you know, to remember our loved ones and so on and so forth. At some point, we'll all be somewhere with a crumbling, <laughs> you know, with a crumbling headstone. Are they called headstones? Yeah, with a crumbling headstone, you know, and with, overgr with overgrown grass and so on and so forth. So, so then the question, you know, becomes what remains of us, right? Like, so eventually we'll be dead and gone as that, you know, and in, in, an, uh, in uh, unmarked graves, as the character says here. But, but, it, but if that's the case, what remains of us, right? Mm -hmm. And part of the answer then uh, for, for the characters is uh, Tizita, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it, the Tizita, because it will continue on, right. is, is eventually what remains of us. You know, the things we create, um, you know, beauty, you know, the beauty we create, that's what will remain of us in the mm -hmm. end. Yeah. yeah, there are so many ways reading this novel that mm -hmm. I, as a writer, that I think of the mm -hmm. writing process mm -hmm. and Perhaps you know an artist would think of the art, the mm -hmm. process of creating art. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's so many questions and mm -hmm. such a deep search underneath it, that yeah. process. Yeah, no, it, it helped. It helped having a character who. Okay, so what happens with uh, with Manfredi, the character? He's like this. Uh, oh yeah, you asked me if I related uh, how I how I think about my characters. Um, so Manfredi, I think, in real life, probably wouldn't get along. You know, uh, just because of di our different politics, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so for him, he grew up in a wealthy family that was, you know, for the dictatorship. Whereas I grew up in a family where, um, you know, where you know we have been persecuted, you know, because of my father's politics, you know, which were against the dictatorship. Uh, but but he's conscious, though. I, I, I would say I admire him in the end, right? You know, because mm -hmm. he, he he can tell that there's something about his place in history that's disturbing him, right? He, he can't quite accept, you know, that this is the life, you know, that uh, that this life of supporting the dictatorship and just being a spoiled, you know, Kenyan brat, if you will. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he, yeah, so, so when he hears the Tizita, then he begins to undertake that journey, right? Mm -hmm. So, but because, yeah, because he's, he's on his own journey, then he can ask questions, right? You know, so, and, and, and I don't think he gets answers in the end, you know, there's no one categorical answer. Uh, but he can, but he's able to ask all sorts of questions in his uh, in his quest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that really works, and that we mm. see a lot of growth in his mm. character mm -hmm. through the journey. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. He he does grow. I mean, yeah, yeah. At the, at the beginning, he's like, oh, I'm just gonna go write this story. It will be a tabloid. Oh yeah, yeah. I should mention also, he writes for a tabloid, right? Yeah, uh, he writes for a tabloid. Uh, so he was just going to go and write this CD story, you know, and then, you know, get drunk, you know, and then, you know, and then move on, right? Uh, but to his credit, when he, hears, when he hears the Tizita, you know, uh, I guess you could say I gave him that journey, right? You know, because uh, when I had the Tizita, I also undertook the same journey of, of wanting to find it and listen to mm -hmm. it and understand it, yeah. And so you chose as your narrator a character who's different from yourself. Mm -hmm. So it's not exactly your story then, and it uh, yeah, no, it's not. Yeah. Own. So what happened was, um, and it's something I I, I I I thought a lot about, but I never wrote about it before. Uh, sometime in the 1990s, when I lived when I was living in Atlanta, 
I met the daughter of one of the people who are responsible for taking my dad into prison, right? Wow. Because of his politics. You know, and uh, what I remember from that, from that encounter, she had so much guilt because of her father's actions, right? And, you know, it's almost as if, you know, even hanging out with me, or, you know, it's a, it, 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 she, I, I, she, I think she wanted my forgiveness, if you will, right? But I've, but I've always thought about that guilt, you know, and how it, for myself I've been lucky. I, I, you know, I don't carry any any historical guilt, you know, because I've, you know, I come from a family that was has been on the right side of uh, of history. But certainly, as a writer, I mean, it's interesting, right? Mm -hmm. Because what do you do with that guilt? You know, do you start an NGO? <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, do you start an NGO? Uh, you know, or do you try to do something meaningful, right? Uh, so in a way you could uh, you could say that this book is written by Manfredi right mm -hmm. as his way of not necessarily atoning or not necessarily for asking for forgiveness but to give something uh that's useful mm -hmm. for other people and he seems to be looking for something meaningful mm -hmm. in his life also uh, yeah 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 I, I mean yeah if, if, if he's more like a if you think of him as a bohemian yeah <laughs> as a Kenyan mm -hmm. bohemian right <laughs> Yeah, so, and, and when he runs into Taliban man, who, who also comes from great wealth, right, uh, Taliban man, you know, at, at some level, Taliban man's rebelliousness is really against, you know, uh, coming ostent ostent ostentatious wealth. You know, he's very gifted, right, uh, as a musician. He could have been a classical pianist and so on and so forth. Um, but Manfred, he does end with Taliban man because he has something, right? You know, he, he's, he's able to play this, Zita, he's able to play this music. Uh, in, in in very meaningful ways, uh, and Manfredi doesn't have that, so that's what he's looking for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, mm. it's a wonderful journey. Mm. Um, that's. I'm going to check and see if we have any other questions. Mm. Why don't we take mm. a um, hear another section? Yeah. So let me. Yeah. So this is. Um, uh, so now the Manfredi uh, is in um, is in Ethiopia, right? Because he has followed all the musicians there, you know. And when he goes there, he you know he visits uh, you know he visits Kidane, he visits uh, Miriam's sister, uh, visits the Taliban man, the Taliban man, uh, and now in this section he has visited the corporal, you know, just to get their stories. And this is the corporal now trying to explain to him what for for the corporal what the Tizita is. Uh, so the corporal says, um, okay, back to the beginning. If you think about it, in the womb there is no light, only sound, the mother's beating heart, for example. The child patterns his heartbeat after the mother's. Life is sound. It does not matter if you are deaf as a stone. You feel sound, the beat, and you build your life, your life around this sound, this beat. You walk, run, shit on it. You live and kill to it. You make love and kill to it, always to sound. Sound is more than rhythm. Sound is everything, the soul. The soul, isn't that a bit vague, I asked. And then the compro continues. Because it, has, because, it is, because it is unknown, we want to call it unknown because that is easy. Think about the first death. That is it to me, for me, is that sound of the first death. The recognition and the surprise and the realization. That first consciousness that realized it was going to be no more and you wanted to leave a message in a bottle that becomes me and you. With the tizita, I can feel it. I know it, but I cannot speak it. So I sing the tizita because it will echo in your soul, sound waves from yesterday's meeting, meeting yours, and perhaps we shall understand something that we do not have words for yet. All I can say is, you can walk for a very long time and get where you're going, but all along, little bits of yourself are left along the way, and you get to where you're going, and there is no going back without stepping, uh, without stepping on yourself. And there is no going forward without eventually tearing your entrails out of your body. The tizita is that impossibility. I am dead and buried, and I'm alive and well at the same time. When I sing, I know what, what that is, even though when I stop, I cannot explain it, understanding with no words, only sound. All right, so, and now, then now, um, then now Manfred is trying to process what he has heard from the, uh, from, from the corporal. So Manfred says to himself, let me put it this way. Historians record history, and even though they are competing versions, it is there on paper. 
In science, every new discovery and, and, and invention is directly tied to the previous one, an archive that is also new. But human emotion, feeling, where is the archive? Philosophy and psychology explain, but where is the archive that we can visit to learn about that first human, what that first human being felt on first experience in love or the tragedy of losing a loved one, the first parent to bury their child? We fall in love and it feels like it's for the first time. We assume the emotions of love. The emotion of love does not contain the archive of past loves from generation to generation, all the way back to that living thing that was gruffly granted. I see, I love. Sound, I think the corporal was trying to tell me, expresses that, that archive, a 200,000 year old archive of extreme, of extreme human emotions. You know, and then they go on. Yeah, but, but that's Manfredi trying to process the you know, it, 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 in, in his own way, right, mm -hmm. uh, what the corporal just told him, yeah. And that scene with the corporal is um, kind of astonishing. Can you describe it a little bit of what is uh, happening when they meet? Yeah, so, it, 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 so it, it, the corporal is very complicated, right? Um, so this is a story somebody told me um, a few years ago, a fellow poet. Uh, he was telling me about uh, Sonny Boy Williamson too, the blues musician, mm -hmm. right? So, but there was a Son Sonny Boy Williamson one, <laughs> you know, but, uh, but Sonny Boy Williamson too, the one we listen to now, uh, essentially took over the Sonny Boy Williamson one, right? You know, so it, and it's, it's, so it's complicated that way, right? Uh, so, so the corporal, it, it, you can't be sure whether the corporal has stolen, stolen somebody's identity, right? You also can't be sure whether he's a war criminal, um, and so on and so forth. So, but at the same time, though, uh, you know, because of all the things he has seen, you know, through war and stuff like that, um, and processing it through the Tizita, uh, somehow he feels he can trust Manfredi uh, with his story, with his story, right? But Manfredi cannot fully trust his story either, right? You know, so, so, so they end up in this very weird. Uh, <laughs> A uh, very weird dynamic. Uh, yeah, but he was a fun character to create, the corporal, yeah. yeah. Um, I yeah. had a, a little bit of a, mm. a connection to Apocalypse Now in that mm. scene, <laughs> not oh, knowing <yeah. laughs> what was going to happen. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and we never know what happens with the characters in the end, right? right. Yeah, they just, you know, uh, they, it, it, the novel ends, you know, and... Um, you know, and, and then I guess, suppose they carry on, right? And Manfredi goes and writes the book. Right. <laughs> yeah, but I wanted to read this passage, uh, you know, because it, uh, it's a, a short passage, but because the book is also about, um, uh, about, about beauty, right? Mm. About, about African aesthetics and so on and so forth. Uh, unless, they are, unless we have more questions. We do, but okay. do read oh. that, because I think that connects to one of our questions. Oh. Too, so. Yeah, so now uh, Manfredi has gone to visit Kidane in her, in her village house, if you want to call it that. And, um, you know, he's tired but can't sleep. Uh, so, so he goes downstairs to find uh, Kidane playing. Uh, so, okay, I undressed, hopped into bed and tried to fall asleep, but I was exhausted. The kind of exhaustion that makes sleeping impossible. A stiff drink seemed like the next best thing. On my way to the kitchen, I noticed the light was on in the small in the small room with a piano and decided to turn it off. But Kidana was in there, stuck naked, headphones on, playing a song I could not hear. In space and heaven there is no sound, she had said back at the ABC. This was as close as I was ever going to get to hearing or rather witnessing music without sound. I did not dare enter to disturb her, so I just stood there observing a naked woman, her hair down to her back, her statuesque figure shaking gently and other times viol violently as her hands moved across the keyboard, sometimes so forcefully that I could feel the reverberations on the wooden floor and up my naked feet, and other times so softly that all I could hear was a light flutter. Sometimes she would hum, but without music, the melody sounded disjointed. It was like watching a painting come alive. I could get why she was playing late into the night, but naked? To stand naked before the Tizita, to share vulnerabilities, to feel it on her skin in a way she could not in front of an audience. Or was it just too hot and she thought I would be sleeping? Or was it my dream? Mm. It's beautiful. Yeah, thank you. The vulnerabilities 
that the artists mm -hmm. have to enter mm -hmm. uh, as part of the work mm -hmm. um, really carries through in that scene. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, thank you, yeah, yeah. Um, you have a question from Madison Tyler who mm -hmm. says, the music and tone is quite melancholic. Mm -hmm. It's quite sad and simultaneously beautiful. Mm -hmm. How do you? How did this dichotomy affect mm -hmm. your emotional state while you oh, were writing this? Okay. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, so I, mean, so I spent so much time listening to this music. I mean, right now, like I can wake up in the morning and I play one of these songs in my head. Like I don't even have to. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to play the actual song, right? You know, mm -hmm. so. It, um, so it, it was it, it it's hard to talk about it now now that i'm out right you know because i you know I'm, I'm outside the novel now uh but it was, it was a beautiful place to be right you know to enter this space where um you know i have these characters who suddenly as i said are dealing with their own traumas uh but have found beauty right you know and maybe that's the ultimate thing that no matter what they have gone through you know and no matter the politics and so on and so forth that they really have found a way to to find uh, beauty, but not beauty in the physical sense. Uh, beauty that allows them to uh, to walk around, right? You know, to be mm -hmm. to be alive, and uh, you know, and that connects them to the to the past, right? And then also something that they will leave behind, right? Mm -hmm. um, so no, it was just beautiful being in that space. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I spent a lot of time. <laughs> You know, I spent a lot of time there. I would like to go back there, actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to ask, do you miss it? Hmm? Yeah, no, I, yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> 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 you know, so I, yeah. I, we'll see what the, nev the next novel, uh, what, what, what the next novel brings. Right. Uh, yeah, but there's a part of my imagination that is like, do you think you could do this again? You know. <laughs> yeah. Can I just keep uh, yeah, creating? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's beautiful. And it sounds like it was necessary mm. after the intensity of the Mrs. Shaw book, uh, yeah. perhaps too, to uh, yeah, as yeah, a novelist yeah. to have these different modes. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, it was necessary. Um, but part of it also, like I don't think I would have written this novel. Um, you know, uh, I don't think I would have written it even ten years ago. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, I think. Um, you know, yeah. I did. So in the same way, you know, I, I think one of the characters in, in the novel says that, um, you know, when you hear your tizita, you'll know it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, and if, if you hear your tizita at the wrong time, right, if you're not ready to receive it, then it will be an, just another song, you know, that you listen to. Uh, so, yeah, so I think I was, when I wrote the novel, I was ready to listen to the tizita mm -hmm. uh, and then to give it all I could in terms of my imagination. Um, yeah, yeah. Like I said, it's it's one. It, I think it's the only novel I've written where I'm actually envious of the <laughs> of the characters, right? Mm -hmm. Because because they are found. Yeah, the, the question you know the previous question in terms of uh, melancholy and beauty, right? right. They, 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 they are not they are not mutually exclusive, right? Right. Uh, and then to have characters who recognize that uh, that healing is not healing in terms of getting rid of the trauma, right? In fact, with the tizita, the fear is actually losing the pain, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so let's say you, you get your heart broken, you know, the, the, the fear is actually losing, uh, you know, losing that pain because then, then, then it's over, right? I mean, <laughs> you know, so so there are ways in which they, you know, with the tizita, you want to stay there, you know, with the pain. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, that reminds me of stories of of trauma victims mm -hmm. also yeah. who. Mm -hmm hang on to their memories mm -hmm. um, yes. almost out of a witness or a mm -hmm. fear of letting mm -hmm. them go or yeah no true that yeah so so and uh, yeah so and you know uh, yeah, yeah you can hold on to trauma in a way that's um you know that's unhealthy i think mm -hmm. right uh, but for them for for, for, for the digital musicians holding on to the pain uh, you know but 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 singing that pain mm -hmm. and singing it right you end up as a, you end up with that space of uh, you end up in being in that space of yeah it's melancholic and sad, but it's also extremely beautiful, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah. So and and I, you know, and they are no. I, I don't think they are looking for healing, mm -hmm. right? I don't think they are looking for healing. They are looking for beauty, which they find. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think that the beauty in this book is very timely for mm -hmm. 
uh, you know. Oh yeah, yeah. So yeah, for like uh, yeah. people on this planet right now. Uh, yeah, like one of the things. Uh, so as a writer, when you have a book out, you know, mm. you want to be out there, right? You know, signing books and right. you know, and doing live gigs and stuff like that. Uh, so so I was a little bit worried about you know about the book coming out during the pandemic, you know. But then the more I thought about it, I was like, you couldn't. You couldn't ask for a better time, you know, for, for this sort of a book to come out, right? Because it's dealing with, it's, it's dealing with all the issues we are, we are, we are dealing with now, yes. right? Uh, so, and to find, and to find beauty in, in, in the times we are in, uh, and the political situations we are in, to be able to find beauty, uh, is, I think it's, it's, it, 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 I can only call it like a gift from life. Yes. Right. Yeah, to be able to say, yeah, uh, you know, we're in a pandemic, we're in lockdown, uh, you know, we are surrounded, you know, by, I don't know how many people have died worldwide, right, and will and, and continue to die, mm -hmm. you know, but to be able to find music or to find beauty within all that, I, I think it makes it powerful. Mm -hmm. And this mm -hmm. is how we survive. And this is how we survive. And is that the whole thing that people realized, you know, that artists, you know, during the pandemic, that artists actually matter, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you can only watch so much Netflix. <laughs> right, absolutely. You know, at some point you have to pick up a book. <laughs> and our musicians ma yeah. matter. Yeah, and, 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 yeah, and musicians matter, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've always been jealous of musicians, actually. Uh, you know, like being able to to have that direct immediate connection with mm -hmm. the people listening to them right right uh, yeah I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually jealous even when they're setting up on stage like testing <laughs> yeah. the mic I would, I would love to do that actually yeah <laughs> absolutely yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah um one more question and then uh let's take a minute mm. to talk about what's next for you okay sure mm -hmm. um a question uh from vera taylor girl mm. i feel I feel it when a written description of something is completely satisfying. Mm. Would it break that spell of the book um, to suggest an art movie that could combine the passion of words and music? Mm. Is she suggesting? Or, or um, sorry. <laughs> Just mm. Would it break the spell of the book to suggest an art movie that could combine mm. the passion of words and music? Um, I mean, uh, no, I, I, no I, I don't know any movie, but, um, you know, that does that. But, yeah, but, it, 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 you know, I would say in the same way that, um, that I think if you're reading the book, you should listen to the Tizita as well. Right. Right. Um, though I, I don't think you can watch a movie and, 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 and read the book at the same time. But, but yeah, but, it, yeah but, but I would say that we need to find beauty wherever we can, right? Mm. And I don't think, you know, beauty is mutually exclusive. Uh, so if if no if, if music if, if it's no music it's it's a movie, a painting, uh, you know we, yeah we just need to find beauty wherever we can yeah right yeah yeah one more question mm, sure the title um, can you tell mm. us something about where the title comes from oh yeah for so you? yeah so the title comes from um, I guess you could say it's a summary of of the passage I just read where um, you know. Um, you know, one day I'll be dead and gone, my grave untended, date of birth and death on my gravestone from centuries past, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, yeah, so, yeah, it comes, it, it's maybe like a encapsulation of that. Uh, but then, of course, the idea that that through the Tizita, right, that through the Tizita, we are also connected to all those people, you know, who have died before us, right? And we're talking generations, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so saying, yeah, because... As long as as long as you are listening to a tizita, then in a way, even though of course physically, you know the people are you know all the, the, the people we love and those who came before them and those who came before them, even though physically they are dead, they are, they, they remain unburied, right? Uh, because of the, because you are listening to the tizita that they themselves listen to or created. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. So we unbury our dead with song, or Beautiful. we unbury our dead with. I think the original title was. Um, we sing the Tizita to unbury our dead. Mm -hmm. But then my publisher talked me into this. And I should mention, you know, that, um, that one, one of the pleasures of this book uh, uh, what is that it's, it was first published in, uh, in Nigeria mm -hmm. by an independent publisher, Kasava Republic Press. And now in Kenya, it's been published by Jahazi. 
another independent press. Oh, great. Yeah, so because usually our books first get, get first get published here, right? And right. then maybe if you're lucky, <laughs> they make it back to your home or your homes. Right. Yeah, so th this this has gone the other way around. It first came from my from my home, so so to speak. Nice. Yeah, and then came here. Yeah. Have you had a chance to share it at home? Uh, no, it, I, I, there's a good chance I'm going going in November. I was supposed to go, I think, in June, uh, but then the, the Delta variant had other plans, so I had to cancel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I, but I think, yeah, but, but I think I'll go in November. Yeah, for, yeah. for a launch in there. Yeah. That's yeah. Great. Well. As we are about to wrap up, mm. what tell us what you're working on now. What's yeah, next? Yeah, so and right now I'm, I'm working on a book on uh, on uh, the relationship relationship between Africans and African Americans. Uh, the the uh, the working title is um, somewhere between Black and African, uh, a biography of my skin, and mm. it's, it's it's a book about my coming to. Oh, it, well, I'm not trying to quote Eddie Murphy, <laughs> but it's a story about my coming to America, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, you know, and, 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 and thinking about blackness. Uh, so, and the book has taken me through different journeys, because um, I'm also thinking about slavery, the role of slavery. Uh, so, I've been to Ghana to, to visit slave castles. Uh, in June, I took a trip all the way to Alabama to visit the Lynching Museum. Uh, yeah, yes, so just thinking, just thinking about blackness. And, you know, and, and, and uh, the past of blackness, and uh, yeah, and and, and, the, and the current state of blackness. Um, I'm writing it for my daughter, right? You know, uh, oh. who was born here, uh, as a way of leaving her a roadmap, if you will. Mm -hmm. A road, you know, as she gets older, like a roadmap for her to that she can use to think about, um, yeah, about, uh, yeah, about her life as a black woman here. Mm -hmm. That mm. sounds really good. Yeah. Um. Well, as we have three minutes left, mm, yeah. um, we should point people to all the resources that mm, you yeah, sure, have yeah. shared. Do you want to say something about um, I actually can't remember exactly. Like <laughs> <laughs> You've got some playlists? I oh, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, so, so, yeah, so the Tizita playlist. Uh, uh, I think I, I put some information about my other books. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if, 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 so um, with this particular book, uh, the, the, the narrator is an investigative journalist, right? But with Nairobi Heat and Blacks in Nairobi, the detective novels, mm -hmm. uh, the, the narrator, yeah, the narrator is, a, is an African American, an African American detective, going back to that. To that, okay. So maybe I, maybe I should backtrack a little bit and and say um, that one of the reasons I'm writing the book I'm working on now. It, it, it's, it, I've been working on it in different ways, right? You know, so in both Blackstone Nairobi and, and Nairobi Heat, you have a Black American narrator, uh, an African American narrator called Ishmael, who goes to Kenya to investigate a case, right? And when he's there, then he for him questions of his blackness come come, come about as well. So it's mm -hmm. it's almost as if we did reverse journeys, right? So I was born here, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I was born in Boston, Illinois, went to Kenya, uh, came back when I was 19. Uh, so for him, if he was born here, then uh, as an adult, he hmm. goes to uh, to Kenya. Um, yeah, but yeah, but yeah, but thinking about our questions of Africans and African Americans. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what other resources were there? Uh, in my scholarly book, mm -hmm. uh, the rise of the African novel, in which I'm looking at the questions of um, the role of English in the production of uh, in the production of African literature. Right. Or I, I should say the negative for the, for myself anyway, the negative role of English in the growth of African literature and its its role in stunting mm -hmm. uh, stunting uh, writing in African languages. Excellent. Mm. Yeah. Well, we are at the end of our conversation, mm. and I want to thank you for this mm. book. No, th th thank thank you, thank you for the conversation. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. and uh, the playlist. I think how mm. often can you? Uh, mm. Read a novel that has a playlist. I know, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah, yeah, I need to learn how to play that Tizita myself. Now. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's yeah. the next that's the next journey. That's the next journey. Yeah. Yeah, and thank you for introducing many of us to Tizita. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I think that Tizita musicians should start paying me now. <laughs> yeah. they're gonna have a be very popular. Yeah. By the time they come here. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. No, thank you as well, yeah. And thank you for, for the people who are listening. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah.